Welcome to Coming Down to Earth, a conflict transformation online summit to explore pathways towards regenerative cultures in a divided world. I'm really happy to welcome today two amazing guests, uh, Clinton Callahan and Anne Chloé Destremo. My French is really rusty. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Clinton uh, is graduated in physics. Uh, you've been doing a lot of things. I think you've, you are like an av avid experimenter. And you've been thinking like kind of in which ways our habitual ways of thinking, our thoughtware is problematic and getting us stuck and what kind of other thoughtwares, other ways of thinking and being in the world could bring about the next culture. And Anne Chloe, you've been you've been joining Clinton on this journey, finding out and in a way I think in your journey to find out your uh, feminine powers as a sorceress and invoking circles of uh, women to explore and bring to the world in full potential the, the feminine aspects, the feminine power. And both of you converge in this kind of search for the next culture, for like how, mm -hmm. how we can shift from the current state and the current system towards a different future uh, you call next culture. And you even brought this idea of a system of archiarchy instead of the current kind of dominant patriarchy. So I'm kind of thinking there's a lot of things we have to, we, I'm, I'm wanting to talk with you guys, but maybe, maybe it's a good, a good start would be to talk a bit about your journey. What, drive, what drove you to start on this journey and that, that led, led to being here today talking about next culture, archiarchy, possibility management, all these things you've been going to explore together. But like what, what in your journey has, has kind of brought you to this place you are in today? Could you tell us a bit? Maybe you can want to start on Ekoe and then we go, we go for Clinton. Yeah, thank you very much, Nuno. Well, I think my journey some, somehow as 18 years old plus so into the adult world started uh, for me as a lawyer. So I, I studied and practiced law in France and Paris and then in New York in the States. And the first day of my, of my job, I was, I, I, I had this sense of, I, I've achieved something. I, I came into the world and I made it somehow. The second day I came in and I just had this clarity. This cannot be my life. This, this cannot be for the rest of my life, working in the office and doing this kind of work. And on the second day, I just decided that I was going to buy a one way plane ticket to New Zealand and that was the beginning of my world journey, which hasn't stopped. So that was four years ago now, five years almost. And I went through a lot of healing during those couple years of really intensely traveling and, and discovering Buddhism and India and working in farms and, and going through a lot of healing of my, my school time a lot. And, and it's when I started this project called Ecosystem Restoration Camp which was a restoration of the land mirrored by a restoration of um, our inner, inner self. So it's sort of this outer permaculture, inner permaculture that Clinton Callahan called me up and said, hey, I want to come. And, I, and the first, my first answer was, okay, we are full. You cannot come. You won't be able to make it. And then he insisted. And finally he came and, and that's when we hit it off and, and really – started to discover or for me to discover what game world was and how to build next culture game world and it became then a hobby and my life since three years now to explore this world and to deliver this work so that people can step into this next culture that's the short version yeah <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much <laughs> thank you Anikoi. Clinton, do you wanna yeah for me i was I was a, a student of physics at a university in California. And until I realized I wasn't learning what I really wanted to learn there. And I, I, work, I got together a group of people and we, we organized for ourselves a, a temporary 
educational community that turned out to be in the very bottom tip of, of Baja, California in, in Mexico. And this, this time together, there was, there was only desert and ocean around us. So the whole construct of the patriarchy or modern culture, there was, there was every bit of water we wanted to drink. We had to carry on our shoulder in big glass bottles for a kilometer or more on the beach that we got from some well somewhere. So it really, it was, it was back to basics. And there was such a wonderful and productive and a successful experiment in creating a nano nation, a tiny little nation of people that established our own culture that I thought, God, this is easy. This is my life. This is going to be my future. So since then, I have tried probably 12 or 13 times to establish a, a culture in, in a game world of, of, of archiarchy, of next culture that, that would feed me, that would turn me on, that is regenerative, that is relational, that has the technologies for circle meetings and circle decisions and dealing with conflict and all of that. And every single one of them has failed as a, and it was a, a learning experience for what doesn't work. So I am, I'm a walking encyclopedia of what doesn't work. <laughs> and, and this has been such a strong motivation for me as an inventor of, of thoughtware, an inventor of processes for transformation and healing and personal, personal development and, and communication and, and the, between men and women and parents and children and game world and another game world and all these places where conflict and, and friction can happen. Like we've, we've just been developing this and it's, it's getting time for our next experiment. So we're really excited. <laughs> so, wow. Uh, it's, it's interesting. One of the things you mentioned that in a way it's at, at the heart of, of why, why we, we are doing this summit is that there's many, many people that we, we meet on a, on a regular basis that kind of get in a moment of their lives where the script doesn't make sense. Like, yeah, <laughs> this kind of idea of, uh, you know, maybe it was our parents or the, the previous generation who went over to us this idea that as long as you do the studies, you go on college, and then, you know, you have this the whole red carpet in front of you. And it's going we to call be, it, we call it the linear life plan. <laughs> the linear life plan. And, and and somewhere along the, that line, things start to, to fall apart and we shift our direction. Actually, we go towards this kind of unknown. And w why we've done this summit is that often people go to places of um, looking for more potential to fully express their potential with a lot of expectations on that the quality of relationships and the quality of the field of, of being together is already embodied by the qualities that we kind of so long, so, so much long for. And then they meet the reality and they, they fail and things some, somehow often collapse. So I'm interested to know what you've been experimenting that doesn't work, particularly when it comes to humans coming together and then facing these tensions and conflicts that, that emerge uh, from interaction in a way that we can actually sustain that next culture you talk about. And so, like, I'm curious to see, like, how, how you came about this, this um, next culture idea and possibility, what's the role of possibility management in that and how it can contribute for us to have a more healthy, regenerative approach to conflicts where they are seen as in a different way so yeah let's 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 get hands on on what 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 is this uh, next culture thing and yeah so what you just described this experience of the script uh doesn't work anymore we call this walking to the edge of what is described today as modern culture this culture that most of us have been born in with this linear life plan. I'm born, I go to school, I go even to university, I find a job, I found a girlfriend, a boyfriend, I get married, I divorce, I change my job. And I, you know, a few times until I die. This is a linear life plan. And what you describe, we call this walking to the edge of modern culture and becoming an edge worker. And when you have one foot 
still in this modern culture and then you're starting to look out what else is there then as you say it's like okay it's the unknown there's not much out there there's no map there's not much plan there's there's not much community of villages that are already out there where you can step into there are some of them and then people go and look for those places what i've discovered going and visiting those places because those are our friends those are our people um is that a, a lot also bring what we call thoughtware they bring thoughtware from modern culture into what they want to create next because most of them are not aware of that thoughtware so the thoughtware is what we use what we used to think with what do we use to interact with the world so it's like our world view our map to navigate reality right is that yeah. yeah yes and and if you keep bringing that thoughtware into this community into this next village the result of that village will be exactly the same so this is why we're interested to go to the core of what makes our thoughtware and this we call our context the, the, the our thoughtware our way of thinking emerges from context which is our relationship to responsibility how do we relate to responsibility so yeah so this what we're discovered is that we human beings in modern culture have not been initiated into adulthood and this is such a shocking realization it's almost unfathomable because the world that we've tried to create for ourselves in the linear life plan is the world of a, an adolescent an uninitiated adolescent and then if you use a hierarchical structure for example for, for an organization any organization that uses a hierarchical structure that that pyramid can be hacked and it's hacked by those people who will do whatever it takes to get a position of power higher up in the hierarchy well the pe people best suited for that are psychopathic. And so that is why when we look around the world at the global hierarchies starting from United Nations and all the big countries and all actually universities and hospitals and every organization even NGOs non-government organizations that use a hierarchical structure at the top you will find uh, a person whose agenda is not about creating a bright future for humanity. It's a person's at the top are going to block that because their agenda is based on terrified fear. They're based on fear, they want to get more power. They want to get more control. And and anything that's submitted to them that has a good heart and a good possibility is crushed and wiped away because it does not fit the psychopathic agenda. This yeah. is not a conspiracy theory. And, and it's it's often it's often men because we live in a in a kind of male dominant society. So I was thinking like what, one of the things you said that struck me a chord is definitely this this uh, awareness, this conscience that there is no more uh, rights of or rights of passage embedded in our modern culture, and mm -hmm. that's particularly critical for men because in a way I think women because and, and correct me if, if you if you have other or bring other perspectives also I mean, but i think women naturally already have the rite of passage of of menstruation that kind of brings uh, them into contact with being a woman in and and the natural world and cycles which which you have to embrace well, and and men don't have that. So men like it's like boys continuing to play with with toys, you know, in a way. So I think I, I wonder so, what. Yeah, I would bring sort of a maybe bigger perspective is that in um, a patriarchal capitalist empire, the men are the masters, and the women are the slave. The slave have way more opportunities and chance to escape that culture and that system than the men who are the master and who get you know and I quote unquote all the benefit from being in that game and the woman really the the woman liberation movement has started about 60 years ago so we've got 60 years head start on on the men and so women the, the women circles um you know connecting to nature but also clarity getting facing our underworld, facing a competition between ourselves, 
for to get the men, all of that we've been facing into and healing and growing up, you know, so that something else is possible. I mean, one of the big issues that we face, each person, each one of us faces this, is that modern culture is functioning perfectly. It is not broken. It is doing exactly what it is intends to do, which is to capitalize nature, hack down everything, burn it, put little numbers in a computer and imagine yourself being successful, forgetting the minor little fact that we're annihilating life on earth at the fastest possible, fastest possible rate. So what we end up with is the necessity to invent a next culture, to go through this gap, because every time you have a structure and you need to change it to a different structure, then there's a liquid state in between. Here's this one structure, here's the next structure. In between is this liquid state. And if you do not know, if you have not been initiated into mm-hmm. inner navigating your feelings, if you have not yet been initiated into a groundlessness, being able to navigate the nothing between one condition and another condition, you will not make the, the shift. And so one of the ways this summit here is has a very powerful function is to be uh, an announcement that modern culture has an edge and we have reached that edge and that also that there are bridges and every single person you bring on on the stage here is a builder of a bridge that people can get attracted to and cross over into a new form of culture. But even going across the bridge, there are these four steps. You know, first you have to find the bridge. First, you have to imagine that there's even a bridge and you're doing fantastic with that. But then the next thing is you got to step on the bridge. Mm. And if you don't step on the bridge, like going, I'm going to try this. I'm going to do the experiments. I'm going to try new behavior. If you don't do that, it's all in your head. Nothing changes. The second, the, the third step on the bridge is to actually learn, like to learn how to live on the bridge. When you step on the bridge, you learn how to live on the bridge and then you turn around and you help, the third step is to help other people learn how to go through this process. And the fourth step is way over there in the next culture. How do you invent the customs, the traditions, the rituals? Every single element of, of modern culture is, is it needs to be reinvented. reinvented. It has yeah. to be reinvented. And that's what this summit is all about, is how do we reinvent? And the thing is, when people resist the the breakdown the the liquid state when people resist the liquid state we do it with conflict so noticing conflict is an excellent sign that something is possible to change there's something that could change here and so our our practice is when there's conflict we dive into it without any judgment it's not good or bad or right or wrong positive or negative it is a feeling anger sadness fear or joy we go in there, and is it a feeling or an emotion? Is it mixed emotions? We clarify all this, and all of a sudden, we have a new person standing across from each other. And this is fantastic. And I, I want to really add that the conflict for us is like a symptom. Mm-hmm. It's just a symptom. So we're not trying to figure out who's right and who's wrong. This dichotomy of right and wrong, or good or bad, comes from it's an unconscious shadow purpose that is used in modern culture so we can blame and find, you know, you can persecute and then there's a victim. You can be the victim. Yeah, it it comes from this space of separation, right? That yeah. You yeah. Either, either defend, you need to defend or, or we need to defend ourselves or we'll be attacked or this kind of Right. Thing. And since we don't have the tools, nothing in education, modern culture education, gives us the tools we need to navigate the, going through the doorway of conflict mm-hmm. into the, the reinvention process. Nothing. So we're really unskilled and the skills are there. So the skills are just at the edge. So you have to go to the edge, find a place to practice the skills. And all of a sudden you become competent in a place that you didn't know before that you were incompetent. And it's such a realization and a joy to feel this new strength. It's like you had wings, but you never knew how to use them before. Things like that. Okay. So I, what I've been noticing is like, so you talk about these stages and the idea that yeah, it's like that I think we experience uh, of all of us in our lives because we, we moved a bit away from the mainstream is this thing of some sort of um, personal disruption that 
that from that linear uh, life plan towards something different and then kind of getting into going to the edge, getting into this unknown place. And then as we kind of find others or find ways to be in that place, we, pra- we start to practice new possibilities or, or, or practice ways of being and, and thinking that can open up new possibilities. And, and is that like well, at the basis of possibility management? What's, well, could you tell us a bit more about, about like yeah. the shape of possibility management, if I can say so? Well, I want to add one more distinction, this distinction that we call box, which is our survival strategy. It's our comfort zone or what other people call a psychology or our worldview. We all have a unique box that we've created so as to survive in the environment that we were born in. The purpose of the box is to survive. It will make anything, create any conflict make any stories up so that we can survive in this small box. When we're 18 years old, we are ready to be initiated into, I have a box, I'm not my box, and neither are they. Mm. So when we talk about conflict, Mm. it is not us who is having a conflict. It is our box. Mm. It is only a box-to-box conflict, and that's... It is such a key distinction for us in possibility management because then people can have, will feel there's this reaction, which we call emotional reaction. There's this righteousness that comes with the conflict. And when, when we point that out saying, okay, that's your box that is helped with what we call this active part of the box, which is the gremlin. Okay, this is your box in gremlin. And so this is not really you. This is not really you trying to have a conflict. And this is such a key, yeah, such a key distinction. And so when we go into liquid state, when there's a change, what goes liquid is your box. But you can stay in connection and stay in the team while your box goes liquid. Well, it's these moment to moment experiences where each one of us makes a decision about an interpretation that we apply to what a person says or the way they behave or the way they, the tone of their voice, or did they flow power to us or take, try to take power away from us? Are they setting up a a conflicting conversation? Are they setting up an empowerment and we can't be empowered. So we have to disempower ourselves. If and these details become more and more apparent while we observe, you know, notice what's really happening in the moment. So, so many of us make assumptions. We make an assumption about how something is, and then we're smart people. So we believe that our assumption is true. And then when you believe your own assumption is true, you assume your own assumption is true, it changes it into an expectation. Mm-hmm. And then we place this expectation on somebody we love, somebody close to us, or even our boss or a colleague or our children or a neighbor. But also our partners. A partner. We put, we, put a, we put this expectation on them and we expect them to fulfill our expectation when they do not. Because they, and then all of a sudden we feel resentment. And so it doesn't take so long when people get together to build up a block of, of resentments in us towards a person, towards an organization, towards a, a, we have this resentment. And so when we're, when we're engaged in our, in our, in our union, when we're engaged in this, um, the opposite of separation, when we're engaged in connection, what we experience is not the connection. We experience our resentment about that other person. And then we're stuck. And then we'll come up with hatred and revenge and the usual things that interfere with love happening. And we have so much possibility to step aside and create a different space and enter a different space that has the clarity, the distinctions, the tools, the thoughtware to step into that, that where where it's almost like, it's, it's almost like, you know, when we go look at two children playing in the sandbox and, you know, Johnny has a toy and Betty wants the toy and she takes it away and Johnny has a fit and he starts fighting, we go children. Children, come on. Okay, let's share. Okay, sometimes we have that perspective, but the, but the truth is we're doing the same thing. 
we're still in this day to day. We're in this sandbox in scarcity, not enough toys, yeah. right? Not enough toys, not enough money to buy the toys. Let's, you know, this is like the world of an uninitiated adolescent. And yeah, and, and, and adding up to that, we have all the things uh, around traumas and, and sufferings that come even from before and that deeply rooted in our cultures. And that's particularly problematic if we consider that our cultures are uh, not, are always designed to avoid suffering and pain. It's like suffering and pain is not, is, you should avoid it at any cost and keep yourself mm-hmm. enjoying and, you know, having a yeah. good time. Think positive. You, know, you see the new age, think positive. As long as you think positive, You'll attract the wealth of the world to you, and I mean, there's a there's a part a partly truth in there in there because you, we know that our inner state affects the world around us and what we think and what we do, and that's part of your work, obviously. But this thing of oppressing parts of us, so yeah. yeah so what we we found some like it's utterly amazing stuff that we found in our research that we're trying to share as widely and as possibly as we can, which is, for example, that yes, we have these experiences, the experiences that you might call feelings, for example, and it's either a clean feeling or a mixed feeling, but we also figured out that there's a difference between a feeling and an emotion. And whereas, and what is the difference? Because they both feel anger, sad, fear, and joy. They feel the same at the beginning. The difference is that a feeling comes up, like you get angry, you use your anger to make a boundary, to say what you want, to change something, to clean up spaces, to get rid of stuff, to invent new things. You use your your anger to take action, and it's completely out of your body in a few minutes. And so that's a feeling. It happens in the present. When when we have an experience, this anger that comes up, and we, we try to do something, we blame somebody, we throw dishes, we kick the dog, we slam the door, we, and, and, and an or, hour or, later, you know, or go we in. We implode, yeah. We implode and go in and beat ourselves up and hate ourselves and like, well, I'll never do this again. Why did, what an idiot, you made this mistake. Like we have all these things that, and it doesn't go away for an hour or a day. Did you ever have that? It stays around for a week. This is an emotion. And the thing is, Feelings are for handling things. Emotions are a doorway for healing things. And so every time a person comes up and has this suffering experience, it is not a feeling. It is an emotion. And that thing is a gateway to a transformational and healing process. And so I I think that the economy of next culture is transformational processes. Like, because it's so valuable and precious for a healing and transformational process to exchange them so that this would be the basis and the economy of next cultures, distinctions, transformational processes, initiatory processes. This is what the economy is based on. The rest of it is fruitcake. The rest is side effects. You know, yeah, we need potatoes and we need to, you know, not get cold from the rain, stuff like that. But, you know, it doesn't mean we need to get from here to there at 200 kilometers an hour in a cool Mercedes Benz. You know, we can walk and we would still have a planet. So anyway, I'm just, you know, we have, this is a short little conversation. We usually talk with people in a sacred space and a transformational space for five day training spaces. And there's so much that can happen in there. Yeah. And And so, so so this is just an invitation, you know, Mm -hmm. this little conversation at the end, we want to give you an exercise to start practicing it and just take yourself there. But right now, this whole thing is like a, uh, like a multicolored painting invitation. Just a teaser. Just a teaser. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to add that, that during in those spaces that we that we hold, like the possibility management trainers hold, is like when one person goes through a healing process, it is so obvious that everybody else heals at the same time, and that's why this like next cultural healing or transformation happens in a team you cannot do this work by yourself that's like the modern culture uh lone wolf i cannot look bad when i look bad it's horrible they're gonna you know kick me out of the group and then there's this whole like the tyranny tyranny of of autonomy and 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 individualism that you have to get your shit together by yourself yeah Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, there's this incredible group intelligence in a circle. I mean, think about it. It's so much easier to solve somebody else's problem than to solve your own, right? Mm -hmm. Somebody says they have a problem, you go, ah, try this, do this, I'll help you do that, and it's handled. But when you go to have your own problems, we're confused because, as Chloe said, our box is about keeping the survival strategy in place because that's what has allowed us to survive. Well, life is about more than survival. There's a possibility of living. There's an entire adult and archetypal world waiting for human beings to hatch out into, to come into and play. Like Gaia, the universe is waiting for human beings to evolve to the next step and play. And that, we're at the edge of that right now. And everybody listening to these talks and workshops, everyone here is an edge worker who's participating in co-creating the evolution of humanity right now. And we, it's a painful, it's a, it's a scary process, it's a joyful process. We are in the middle of it. It's just beginning, really. Let's dive in. Well, let me get a deep breath on that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think one of the things you mentioned that, that you work with uh, in, in possibility management and bringing about the next culture that is very dear to me is this idea of when there is a problem coming up, a tension in you or in between people that you just don't like rush into solving the things but actually re lean on and pay attention and, and offer create a space where you can go deeper into what's kind of wanting to manifest here. And that, that finds that sounds very relevant, particularly in this moment when everybody's trying to kind of identify who was the responsible, what was responsible for this phenomenon of the COVID, what is this kind of alien thing that is coming to attack us and how we can get rid of it as fast as possible and come back to things as usual while it feels like this is another uh, another agent or maybe an angel of the liquid state you talk about, like some, some uh, another invitation to be in this space of liminality that we know we are transforming into something and we don't know exactly how to be in that place. It's so tempting in a, in a breakdown or a painful situation, a scary situation, to try to basically fight or attack the existing game worlds. So like to try to to try to attack them and, and and force them to change, and they really are well defended. Like modern culture uh, has so many uh, cameras and guns and uh, sonic waves and weapons. I mean, like we are to to fight that thing with pepper spray in your eyes. It's like that's not the point. You know, like Buckminster Fuller said. You know, you don't change things by fighting the existing game worlds. You change things by building new game worlds that make the existing game worlds irrelevant. He used slightly different words from that that are uh, no longer valid. Like, so, but, but if you use the words I just said, it's, it's so clear that what we're doing is an empowerment, an exploration, a collaborative um, invention of the next culture by building the game worlds. It's like like you said, when we game, were game worlds is like what a set of sets of rules, different sets of rules, different ways of thinking. Could could you kind of okay? So I mean, every single interaction that we have that's formalized is happens within the context of a game world. Of a game world, yeah. And this is a new awakening. We always thought that that a government exists, or a school exists, or a, a driving licenses. You want to drive a car, you have to have a driving license, it's all, it seems to us to be the way things are. Mm -hmm. Every single one of those things was invented by human beings. Every single one of those yeah. constructs is a game. And then there's certain ways that you play the game. I mean, just imagine football. If you, if you put a, a tennis player into a football game, it's not long before you end up with a net across the field. I mean, if you change one rule in any game, you have an entirely different game. So I, for example, I mentioned this, just this thing about valuing who decides what you value. You know, it's, it's such a, so money is a game world. Banks are a game world. Credit cards are a game world. The whole entire government is a game world. And the thing is not, it's not producing the results that will give us a regenerative future. And, and uh, this distinction is really, mm. it's so big, 
because when we realize how devastating, how we give our authority away to game worlds that we thought were real, <laughs> like money, like I need money to live, or I need to, I need money to buy food, I need to pay my rent, all of those that made up game world, when we yeah. realize that we've given our authority in our life and our time and our energy and our love to that fake game world, it's so devastating because then it's like we realize all the other possibility that we're already there, but we, we blocked it with our own filter. And at the same time, it's so empowering because that what that means is, is that <clears throat> Let me just go back to this thing. It's like when we are first born, when you, if you can remember back to being first born, there was a vision that you had with you, some, some, something that you thought the world was going to be like, some reason that inspired you and made you so <clears throat> excited about wanting to be born. And then, and then you, you get born and then you encounter school or you encounter people can't see you they don't recognize the vision that you hold in fact it, it it's so shocking that the the difference between the vision that you hold and the world that exists we often go into this this suffering mode this we pull in we we go we give up we want to fight this you know we just um we do whatever we can to survive but the thing we've been figuring out is that the the vision, the surroundings that you expected to find, the thing that you carry with you, you expect, that you're hoping to find in the world is exactly what you came here to build. This is, and so that is so precious to get back in touch with this vision that you brought here of, like you said, connection or possibility or um, discovery, like whatever the whatever you carry inside of you, this nature, being in nature, this whole aliveness thing, that's what you came here to build. Mm, yeah. That's very interesting. And, and that's a huge healing. Yeah. I mean, um, most everybody who's listening right now, you're an edge worker. Mm. And not everybody in the world is an edge worker because already we would already be in next culture if that was the case. So the edge worker the other people need you to build the game world that you, you are longing for so that they can come and play in. Because if there is no place for people to play, they will, they will keep playing in the old game world because they don't have the clarity or the pain or the matrix, what we call the matrix, to build that game world. But the people who are already listening, okay, you've made it to the edge. Okay, next job is is build the bridge, build the next game world. And so this is why our suffering is such a, a golden key. It is such a doorway to having taking back our power. It's like every time we have this conflict, it's a it's this doorway mm -hmm. to re the, inventing the next thing. And so this is why we call it possibility management. Is that to be stuck in the conflict is a lack of possibilities. You're needing yeah, some yeah. new possibilities. Well, who who brings in the new possibilities? It is somebody skilled in the transformational process called a possibility manager, or sometimes we call them a possibilitator. Okay, where's the possibilitator? <laughs> Ask the possibilitator. How do we handle this? And it's a role in every village. Every village needs the possibilitators. So there are people out there who are trying to be different professions that already existed, and we need new professions. There's a whole series of new professions that we need. We need game world builders. We I mean, need the this is bringing something to me, Clinton. We already we already mentioned that our our culture current dominate the uh, um, dominant culture lacks rites rites of passage and the initiation of of people, particularly men, but I would say people in general to, towards adulthood. And I remember we talked when we had the preparation for this meet for this interview about this idea that we are in this we are just at the edge of moving from a juvenile competitive human uh, stage towards a collaborative mature stage. So this, we are in this liquid state. You you call it what you call liquid state. Uh, the thing that being in this place. We, when we bring new thoughtware and new ideas and new things into place, we're going to obviously because we can, we have one step on the two on the two places. We have one step still. We, we grow up in this in this stage, as Anikolaid has said. 
So we, we're going to fail several times. So also that, so for me, there's this thing about that failing and being in conflict is something collective, as you mentioned. So it's something that is not like, okay, the two of you are having an issue, sort it out, and mm-hmm. is is more like, can we hold space collectively for allowing this thing to to become clear if because most of the things are actually collective. And this thing of the roles is very interesting, new roles, because one of the other thing I was going to say that I didn't finish is we lack elder, elders, the function of elder, because the old people who had have an experience of failing and of suffering that allowed them to develop wisdom also to reach to a point in their lives where they could hold space for others. Now in our society, they're considered like they, they are way, they, they don't have any productive life anymore. They don't have a function. And, and it's not only a question of age. I would say elderly is a role of, of maturity, of someone who has gone through a certain uh, journey. And yeah, you're talking about the initiators. Where are oh, the initiators? Because, yeah, when I hear initiators, also when I hear possibilitators, I also hear that function of someone who has, because of their life journey, is in a place that can uh, help people come, come, in to, come to see that the possibilities that are there. <laughs> In one of the gifts that I've attached to the, our screen on the website, it, it says an article that's about 15 pages long that is called, it's uh, Healing with Clarity. And it has this thing about, it explains what we mean by five bodies, four feelings, three worlds, two dramas, and one simple truth. And it's like, it's, it's an amazing empowerment to be to to do that and also i'm attaching a thing called treasures we have this uh, it's a treasure chest full of links uh, and each one of those links we have we have over 320 websites that we've been building in the last few years 320 websites each one is a treasure chest full of new clarity new thoughtware experiments to try challenges to face into you know, videos and books to read and movies to watch and so much treasure. So so we threw a couple of them into a list. And that's also one of the um, gifts that we're they're handing out to people. So please, please take a look at those as resources. And I, I want to say, if you have this pain with this question that you, you have, Nuno, but also everybody else out there about, Okay, where are the role models? Like, where are the initiators that I can knock on the door, say, hey, I'm 18 years old or 20 years old, and I need initiation? Because when we were 18, we thought something big would happen to us. So I don't know. Did you have that sense that when you were 18 or 19? Yeah. yeah. And then what? We we go to college. We can drive. We can drink. What? And really nothing happens. What we're waiting for is this, this shift from our childhood to our adulthood. This, this initiation. So when you have that pain, it means that probably you are one, you are an initiator that's not been initiated into being an initiator. Mm-hmm. But there is a, a program that I'm holding space for called the trainer path into possibility management. And this is the curriculum. This is the school to become an initiator in the, in the world. This is the village of initiator. So yeah, that's something else. If you have that pain, you can also reach out to me and, those places exist where you can be initiated as an initiator. It's, it's really important to understand that the kind of initiatory processes needed now are very entirely different from the initiatory processes that work in indigenous cultures. So the whole idea, a lot of times, right of passage is this uh, refers back usually to an ancient or traditional culture. But, but think about it. In the initiatory processes from an indigenous culture, your assemblage point is removed from your mom your anchor point is moved away from your mom and put into the context the traditions of your village the traditions of your culture and then you become a man or a woman in the style of your culture your game world called the culture and then you know what kind of clothes to make for yourself what kind of how do you make a canoe how do you build your house when to plant the crops what are the recipes? What are the songs to sing when people are dying or sick or dead? How do you do healing? The whole thing, the authority for your entire life is in the traditions of the culture. So that works very well when you have a culture that is noble and 
when you have environmental conditions that are stable. We have neither one of those conditions right now. Both of those are not the same. We need a different kind of initiatory process. And the way this one works is you take your assemblage point out from your mother and, you, and it's put, the initiatory process is put that assemblage point, your point of origin, in your own center. And oh my God, all of a sudden you are responsible. There is no external authority responsible for every single decision you do in your life. We call it radical responsibility. This is an every single process that makes you, that builds the thing in you that where you're able to take more responsibility is an initiatory process. There are thousands of them and they don't stop mm -hmm. after one rite of passage to adulthood. It's an ongoing evolutionary thing and there is no top end. There is no wow. top end to where these things go. I've been in this journey for since 1975. It's like, it's like what, 45 years. So it's like, 55 years. 55 years. <laughs> so, so, so no, no, I since 75, it's 45. It's 45. <laughs> 45 years. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, so, yeah. You know, I know because I was born one year before. So all right. <laughs> so, <laughs> so look. So what we have, what, what we have is this, and, and it's a it's an evolutionary path that's celebratory the whole time. And there's so many inner and outer resources for us to jack into that modern culture knows nothing about that yeah. has surprised me over and over and over again. It's like it, we have this procedure called rapid learning. It goes beep, shift, go, beep, shift, go, <laughs> beep, shift. Go. I've got so many beeps <laughs> and I've also got so many goes. And this is an amazing team, team intelligence process. We have this procedure called the frying pan where when two people are having a conflict, we, we put them in the middle of the circle with two other people and have them have a conversation that's a, a, a moderated conversation. And, and, and anybody in the room, when the chairs are empty, anybody in the room can say, you two people need to talk. And you can pick anybody from anywhere and have them talk. Or if one person sits in the circle, they can call anybody else into the chair across from them. And if you're in the room, you're in the game. And this thing is such, the frying pan is such an amazing a tool for circular meeting technologies. We have a whole nother treasure chest. There's a touristtechnology.org website with a bunch of tools on it. We're, we're trying to give away as fast as we can. So Thank it's you not, so much. you don't have to reinvent the wheel. There's stuff is happening. There's so many people um, providing yeah. new thought where and, and initiations that is, you just jump into what's happening. But, but you would decide how you, like there's all those tools, but you would decide how your next culture works. Mm -hmm. So we, we usually use the term next cultures because it's not one uh, dominant yeah. culture. Yeah, it would yeah, be yeah. each unique one. Yeah. But it's Thank just for that. Yeah, it's just based on the, it's just based on the on the context of radical mm -hmm. responsibility. Because modern culture, you know, if you think about when a child makes a mess, who cleans it up? Well, it's obvious that the adults clean it up. And then you look at modern culture and go, uh, is modern culture making any messes? Do they have any intention at all of cleaning them up? And the answer is no, no. It's making lots of messes and no intention at all of ever cleaning them up. Modern culture is centered on child level responsibility, even people at the highest levels of power in the culture. And so next culture is adult and archetypal, radically radical responsibility and and it's a different game world. It just is a whole different context. Yeah, we, we, we're heading towards wrap up. And one of the one of the things you mentioned, I'm so I'm so happy for that. Is uh, that is very dear to me is this idea that this notion that uh, transformation and change is not something distant. Is actually you know part of of, of life. And obviously, conflicts is conflict and tensions within us or between us is is a particular invitation to that space of possibilities for transformation and that you don't need to think like someone out there will change the world or or that i need to go to that space of power to which is kind of the, the current world game is you need to go yeah. to the top of a party to be elected to be president and then maybe you can shift things and is actually turning it upside down to say each one of us have power. There's this radical responsibility that every day, the way we show up and the way we interact 
is already a, 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 an embodied way to to bring the new world. So how we connect with that and take responsibility for showing up and then creating spaces of practice. That's another thing you mm-hmm. brought that I think is really important and, and Koe, about this of finding others and practicing and embodying the qualities, knowing that we'll fail and we need to hold that space. We're getting to the end. I know you have some exercises to invite people in. So maybe you are, and the floor is yours to, to say some final words and, and invite people into something. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, one so one the the practice that we want to give you, and it wouldn't be a one one time practice. It actually would be like a daily practice that you can do, and it's about changing your relationship to feelings and emotion as one of your resource for your life and destiny, and for your relationship, and to also navigate conflict. And so, to change this relationship, this practice will have three stage, and so and I'll demonstrate. Maybe the first two, and then Clinton, we can demonstrate together this, the third one. The first stage would be for exa- to pick one object around you, really any object. And I'm going to pick the microphone into which I'm speaking. And I'm going to check into my heart, into my emotional body, what I'm feeling about this microphone. Okay, right now I feel scared about this microphone because it's recording what I'm saying, and a lot of people are going to listen to it. And so I feel scared of saying something that would be valuable and, or maybe not stutter. And I also feel like, I also feel sad about this microphone because it only would record this like hour and not, I have so much more to say. And I feel sad that I don't have spaces with all of you guys. Yeah. Listening to this interview in which I can speak. I feel angry about this microphone because it's not mine. It was lended and I have to give it back. And it's a great microphone. But I also feel really glad that from here I'm in, in Germany, people from all across the world can, can hear me and, and can also hear other people with this technology. So I feel really glad about this technology. Okay, that's the first exercise. Which can I just, yeah. So this is a complete communication mm-hmm. with regards to feelings. Anger, sadness, fear, and joy. It includes all four. So often when we try to communicate our feelings, we pick one. I'm so sad. You know, you abused me. You ignored me. And then that's the end of the communication. So what we're, a, new, a new practice is each time you're checking in with somebody, each time you're sharing what you're feeling, say the one that's first, but then say the other three. And it's also helpful to say, and this is a feeling or, and this is an emotion. And the hint is that basically everything we feel until we get initiated into this is emotional it's a it's a reactivity that comes from being triggered our buttons are pushed we have some expectation that was not kept so it's to, to say hey it's an emotion and i'm projecting on you because of this thing and go through the healing process so it's so helpful to have a couple of distinctions it's a anger sadness fear or joy other all the other emotions can be are blended up for example depression is just a mixture of anger and sadness. Mixed together at the same time, you have depression and you can learn to separate those feelings and you won't have depression anymore, but you will have anger and you will have sadness. And those are very useful things. So this is, a, this is the first part of the practice is the anger, anger, sadness, fear, and joy. So with the second part, would you do it if I explain it? Yeah, what is it? Okay, the second part of this exercise, you're still in, in connection with your emotional body and your heart, but this time you check inside mm. and you say, uh, you say uh, you're, what you're angry, sad, scared, and glad about, like your life or your inner state right now. So Clinton, would you do that? Yeah. So I'm angry right now because... There, we've opened up a space, and I love this space. And personally, I live for these spaces of, of clarity and possibility in people. I love the people listening to this. I know I can't see you on the screen right now, and it is in the future. And this whole time space thing doesn't really matter. I can already feel connected to you. And I'm, I'm really angry that we're, we're gonna, the space will end soon. I can't be with you. And that I'm also sad because the the exchange that we have i've been a researcher my whole life and i get turned on when i get to share the results of my research so i'm i'm trying to you know i'm speaking fast i'm trying to cram as much stuff as i can in here for you guys and i know i will never get enough it makes me sad 
And then it makes me scared. I feel scared about it too, because the the shift into upgraded thoughtware, because we, we're using standard human intelligence thoughtware, shit thoughtware that we've got from modern culture. And that the, the shift is so fabulous. And I feel scared to to not make this like to fulfill my commitment. I made a commitment to the bright principle of clarity that if clarity gave me everything it has, I will give it away to a million people. And I don't know if I'm keeping my commitment or not because the clarity is fucking keeping its commitment. It is downloading stuff for me. And I feel glad to have be able to, to have a safe space here. I am Chloe's holding the space for me to make a, a vulnerable sharing about my inner state right now. And you know what I love about this, what makes me so glad, is that I can't be wrong. Like when I'm sharing this with you guys, you can't say I'm wrong, you know. And when you share it with me, I can't say you're wrong because this is what I'm feeling right now. So this is anger, sad, fear, and joy in the Clinton channel right now. Great. And I just want to take it a, a step further. Wait. So we're saying this. Yeah. That you guys are going to do this. Yeah. When you get off, you're going to get in pairs. You're going to first, one person says anger, sad, fear, and joy about an object. The other person does anger, sad, fear, and joy about an object. Then you shift to the check-in from each person. So then each person goes back and forth and does what I just did. And then you do this third part. The third part is one would person would start and you, you look at this person across from you and you'll have feelings and emotion coming up already. Okay. And, and you'll be, you'll check in this part of being vulnerable with what is really going on when you connect with this person. So right now I feel the biggest feeling is glad. I feel really glad to co-create, be in this creative collaboration and interrupting each other the whole time because we have so much to say and that there is so much resonance between what we want to create and that I found you and that we can do this together is amazing. Thank you. I fear scared. This is maybe I fear scared when I see you because I see that you're sweating and we have a light here going on and I, I'm scared because I think it's too hot and I, I'm not as sensitive as you to the heat. So that makes me scared. No, but come on, take a bigger risk. A bigger risk yeah. about the fear. Yeah. Okay. I fear scared. Yeah, I, I'm sure scared about a lot of things. I feel scared that you, that I interrupted you when you wanted to say a perfect jewel that will like change somebody's life on the other side of the screen, and you didn't, you were not able to say it because I jumped in. I feel sad because I feel yeah connected to you. I feel that I am with you, and my my sadness helps me to. Uh, even if we're looking in like one direction towards Nuno, when we when we co-create, um, my sadness allows me to stay in touch, be with you. Thank you. And I feel angry. I feel angry about about, about I feel anger about you. Let me check it. You can even close your eyes yeah. when you're doing this to so just check in. Yeah. I feel angry about you that you're not doing this on stage for 10,000 people like every day and that we don't, so you don't have more impact in the world and you're building amazing websites, but you, you're not talking to 10,000 people. Thank you. Thank you. To, to, okay. to do this, I just want to say it helps. It really helps to use the new thought we're about feelings that there isn't just one good feeling and three bad feelings. You know, it's not like joy is good and fear and sadness and anger are negative or bad because they're not. And the new map of feelings, all for each of the four feelings has its own special energy and information that you need for for. Everything has its application for in your life to make it's the rocket fuel to deliver what you came here to create and build what you came here to build. You need those four feelings turned on. And so when Anne Chloe was sharing this with me, she could say the, the horriblest thing about what she's scared about or angry about. 
And you know, I'm I'm going to say thank you because she's sharing what's going on for her, and and I might I'm, something might click in me like God, I didn't I didn't think about that really. She's angry because I'm not on stage with ten thousand people. Well, what can I do about that? Because I do not I don't want to live with a woman who's unsatisfied with. At that level, so baby, we're going to go on stage for ten thousand people and hold on to my pants now. Oh my god! So I mean, it's so valuable, and it's better than television. It's better. Like we, we watched a film last night, and after the film, we look at each other and go, "Our life is better than this film." You know, and it's a, then at the end of the movie, the guy drives off with the woman in the sunset, and it's like, "Our life is better than that." You know, so so wow. so. Yeah, so this is the exercise we and, want to share. And with then you change roles, and yeah. then Clinton would, would be doing yeah. it with me. Yeah. And there are things I'm really angry about and sad and glad and scared. <laughs> you. I'll tell I you know, later. I'll tell you <laughs> Thank you it's so much, Clinton. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, Anne Chloe. It was, okay. was an amazing conversation. I got I, I got all sparked again to, to do something with you guys. I, I told you I've been trying to do something around possibility management already for a few years. It connects me a lot with your work. So thank you for that. I hope everybody who's listening to us got also inspired. Go and check out the, the, the gifts that you both uh, offered to explore a bit more about next cultures, Archiarchy and possibility management, and uh, hundreds of websites and different treasure hunt. You can do a treasure hunt and go yes. around, go around the web and explore things and bring them to your own life and and adapt them to the ways that serve you. So, thank you so much, the two of you, for showing up, for being who you are, and for sharing your your gifts with the world. Thank you. Thank and we just we just want to thank all the all the listeners and viewers and the, especially when you do the experiments. Like we have spark experiments and all these experiments when you do the experiments. I love you guys when you do those experiments and talk to us if you have yeah. questions just we're, our our contact info is all over the place. Just talk to us and we'll look to, forward to seeing you guys. And Nuno, thanks so much. Yeah, thank you, Nuno, and for putting together this this summit that is about diving into also our shadows and, yeah. and into the underworld to come back with the treasures. There are maps for the shadow world. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs>